Rugby is a global community, movement and family. And at the heart of the family are the players. Rugby continues to partner with independent experts to advance player welfare. And that includes the important area of brain health. There is increasing discussion around brain health in society and sport, especially as the science and information evolves. But what is brain health? Why is it important? And what can we do for future generations and players who have or are about to retire from the game? Today, Jamie Roberts and I are talking with some of the leading experts in this area. And while this discussion focuses on former players, this information has relevance to all members of the rugby family. So welcome everyone. My name is Sene Naupo and joining me here in Dublin is Dr. Fiona Wilson, Professor Craig Ritchie and Dr. Willie Stewart joining us from Edinburgh, Karen BK Chan joining us from Toronto, and last but not least, Jamie Roberts joining us from Cardiff. Brain health is an important area of discussion, but what is brain health? Yeah, I mean, the, at the end of the day, the brain is who we are. It's, it's how we think, it's how we act, how we react, how we plan and, and how we feel. Uh, and it's affected very much by, you know, our social environment, our, our physical environment, our mental health. And, and also, of course, the brain affects all of those things too. You know, how we act in society, how we react to circumstances. And the choices that we take will have an impact on brain health. Both, you know, good choices can improve brain health and, and maybe not so good choices can have a ne negative impact. Brain health is influenced from really pretty much what you do from, from birth onwards. And, and playing rugby can have a, a really important influence on that too. We used to say that, you know, what's good for your heart is, is, is good for your head, but now maybe given the importance of the brain, we should be saying what's good for your brain is, is good for your heart. And I think one thing that's really important to, to, to recognize is that concussion and brain health are not exactly the same thing. I mean, brain health is so much more uh, than just concussion and, uh, and head injury. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's a lot of talk in sport and the wider public about dementia and CTE. Craig, Willie, can you tell us a little bit more about each of these? Dementia is just an umbrella term uh, that we use to describe a, a series of conditions that affect memory and our thinking abilities. Alzheimer's disease is just one example of a condition that, if left unmanaged, could lead to dementia in later life. And it's important to realise that just losing your keys or forgetting the names of, of, of people uh, isn't necessarily uh, always related to, to, to Alzheimer's disease or to dementia. And it's also important to recognise that we've learned that the diseases that lead to dementia in later life um, probably start uh, at least in midlife, if not even earlier. And there's lifestyle decisions that we can make around various risk factors for dementia that may have a really positive impact on our risk of developing uh, dementia later in life. The question about what is CTE comes up a lot, and, and CTE is just short for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and it's a form of dementia, a form of degenerative brain disease, a bit like Alzheimer's disease. But the, this CTE is one that we know is associated to exposure to brain injury. So previous exposure to brain injury, often talked about in sports, potentially leads to this long progressing degenerative brain disease where the, the functional cells of the brain are lost and that leads to all the different symptoms we see. Now that, that's a process that begins in midlife. We know that's, that's where the, the process begins and it presents much later in life. Now what we want to do is try and address this, this bit in the middle before the symptoms develop, where people have perhaps the, the disease progressing but haven't yet developed symptoms. And that's where the important research we're doing in men and women is hopefully going to give us some clues as to where we go next. Willie, where does brain injury come into play with brain health? So brain injury is one really important risk factor for dementia, one of these important modifiable risk factors for dementia. And sports, you know, globally have recognised this and are doing what they can to better recognise brain injuries and manage these wherever they occur and also deal with unnecessary head impacts. But inevitably, uh, some element of brain injury is still going to occur in sport. You know, so, so people are leaving sport and having had their brain injury and, and that's a, a risk factor they carry. The important thing is what we're now trying to do is address the other risk factors and try and, as far as possible, make a difference to reduction in risk. We're also working hard on research to try and understand differences in risk that may be between the sexes. So what's the risk between male and female athletes um, in the, the risk factor for brain injury, but also going forward in brain health later in life. One, one way to think of this is like a, a, a set of balancing scales. 
okay? And the balance can tip towards adverse brain health or, or dementia. And what could tip that balance? There are things that we, we're not in control of. For instance, age. Age is one of the strongest risk factors, if not the strongest risk factor for dementia. There's nothing we can do about getting older. That just, that just happens. So that's, that's tipping the balance one way. Genetics, you know, what, are, what our parents have given us in terms of our genes can also provide us with a risk for dementia. Nothing we can do about that. So it begins to tip the balance. Now we can add into that things like, for instance, brain injury and exposure, exposure to head impacts. Um, and that can again just, just push us towards a, a slightly higher risk of dementia. Now sports are doing fantastic things to try and reduce the risk of head injury and measure and reduce the risk of head impacts, but they are there and we need to recognise that. But what can we do perhaps to tip the balance the other way? And that, that's these other modifiable risk factors that we recognise. That if we can address these and improve on these, we might be able to just tip the balance back in favour of good brain health. And now that's things like, again, thinking about uh, hearing loss, uh, thinking about depression, mental health, and how we can address these. Craig, can you tell us more about the key modifiable risk factors that you've mentioned? Currently, there are 12 known modifiable risk factors for dementia. And some of those risk factors are associated with good physical health, things like minimizing the amount of alcohol we drink or avoiding smoking, maintaining good cardiovascular or heart health through keeping your blood pressure under control. But there's other risk factors which are maybe more closely associated with brain health, things like social isolation or loneliness is thought to be related to dementia risk as is hearing loss, depression and stress, etc. Participation in rugby through good physical exercise, through good nutrition, is channeled, if you like, into protecting uh, brain health. Really important to recognise that one of those risk factors for dementia in later life, only one of them, is brain injury. Uh, and I think if we can look at identifying how to improve or maintain the other 11 risk factors, it uh, will set us you know, up well for reducing the risk of dementia in later life. Just leading from the last question, I've heard of a number of former players who are concerned about their brain health. What do you make of this? There's a, there's a lot of great work underway to really understand, you know, how we can uh, how we can manage risks and intervene to improve brain health. But it's really about an individual working out their own risk profile, if you like, and working with healthcare professionals to help do that. And identifying areas where you say, look, I can work on that, I can train on that, I can make that one better, and I can maybe do less of that one, which is negative for me. And this risk profiling, this individual risk profiling, is critically important as we manage our own brain health for the future. We're at a point, though, where there's possibly a window of opportunity when we can uh, make decisions about our lifestyle that can have a positive impact uh, on our brain health. And, Particularly when players are just finishing the game, heading towards retirement, they can make some active lifestyle choices that, as we've said, improve their brain health or maintain their brain health into later life. And there's also an opportunity for the younger generation of players to be well informed, to learn and be empowered about what knowledge is out there to make good decisions while they're playing the game, which they can carry with them uh, into, into retirement and later life. This idea of loading on benefits um, and tipping the scales in one's favour. It's a really interesting concept. I know social isolation was mentioned as a factor earlier. Um, I can now see maybe how we or a team approach to this is, is perhaps more suitable. Uh, where might this come in, Craig? Is there any evidence around rugby's role? We know that social isolation is a risk factor for dementia in later life. So I think what the rugby community has provided while a player is playing shouldn't be lost when they approach retirement or, or have retired because I think that might then be you know, a positive you know, uh, aspect of their life while playing rugby shouldn't become a negative uh, when they retire. And I think one of the other uh, important uh, risk factors for brain health is, or poor brain health is, is poor cardiovascular health. When someone's playing rugby, they'll be optimizing their cardiovascular health and their fitness. When a player retires, should be looking at, well, how can we maintain that into mid and later life? There's also evidence that being physically healthy, physically active, uh, reduces your risk of developing conditions like depression, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So these are all things which we know to be associated with poor brain health. There's also uh, a really important element around nutrition. There's very strong evidence that having a what we call a Mediterranean style diet is good for, for brain health and indeed for, for physical health generally. So avoiding beige foods, as we call them, is, is something that would be uh, useful, not just when you're playing the game, when your diet has probably been, been well controlled and managed, but also after you've retired, uh, maintaining those healthy lifestyle, healthy eating behaviours uh, through midlife and into late life will reduce your risk of developing dementia. Absolutely.
Fiona, uh, off the back of what Willie and Craig have explained already, uh, could you speak about what players approaching retirement or maybe in retirement already might consider? Retirement from the game in itself can tip the scales. So it's really important to think about what you might need in your toolkit for this phase of your life. This might be the first time that you've had to organize your own meals, that you've had to organize your exercise program. And this can be a real challenge. It can be lonely and isolating. So it's time to think about what type of exercise you're going to do for health. And this may be a time to take up new exercise such as running or cycling, something different. What's really important is that you choose an exercise program that you'll like, you'll enjoy and you maintain it won't be a burden because this is going to be really important for your brain health. Up to now you've exercised for performance and this will be the first time that you've had to do it for health. Maintaining cardiovascular exercise or aer aerobic exercise is really important. Having a strength training program can help maintain joint health. You may have some injuries from when you were playing. This is going to be very important. This will also help keep your weight down, maintaining your muscle mass. Checking in on markers of your health is also really important. So this is things like body weight and your blood pressure. These are often ignored and these can creep up after you retire. And you can help maintain these in a positive way with a good exercise program. Well, we've talked about quite a number of areas here. Maybe just think about one or two to get started. Think about these before you retire and have a plan. Talk to your family and friends. As an athlete, you have a really good understanding of exercise. So in retirement, this is an opportunity to use your brain and your skills in different ways for the good of your own health. Thanks Fiona, some really practical advice. And in planning, will everyone's toolkit look similar? Craig, as a clinician, what can you tell us about this? So what we're looking to do is work with uh, the individual to optimise the intervention, the treatment under what we call a personalised prevention plan. So we'll do three things, we'll do risk factor profiling, We'll look for early disease detection through things like brain imaging or memory testing, etc. And with the results of that, we'll put it together for a personalised prevention plan. Um, and in brain health services that are popping up, dare say it, across the country, that's the environment where these uh, clinical assessments and management plans uh, will be undertaken uh, and put in place. Because this is quite a new area, we're collecting lots of really good, high quality data. So that all the time we're improving what we can tell an individual about their risk profile and what it means for the future in terms of their likelihood of developing a dementia. So combining the clinical service with good data collection will help us to optimize and improve these services uh, as time goes by. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Uh, there's been discussion around applying and using the tools rugby and sport can provide for good. BK, uh, what other existing areas or assets and knowledge can help players to look after their brain health? As players specifically and athletes in general, you already actually have a lot of skills that can help. Discipline, a willingness to persevere, patience, and an understanding and appreciation for the human body. These all help you set achievable goals and work at them. For many players, attending to their physical health, of course, comes second nature. Attending to mental health, however, may be a new territory for some people. It requires fighting against existing stigma and breaking through some of the silence around this topic. It takes leadership and a growth mindset. It also means unlearning some habits that many athletes may have picked up over the years, like the grin and bear it kind of attitude or believing that you can just power through mind over matter. This is a real evolution in sport at this moment. Toxic positivity, the expectation to be superhuman or to plow through pain with stoicism, to not get help, not get support, to be defined by what you can do and what you perform only, these are showing themselves to be actually quite detrimental to mental health. So in order to really tackle this problem and to be proactive about brain health, we have to break the taboo around isolation that many people, many players put on themselves. So that means starting small by tuning into how you feel, knowing and noticing the signs of anxiety and depression, like 
uh, irritability, observing that you're self-medicating through drugs or alcohol or overwork, sleep disturbance as too much or too little, loss of interest or enjoyment in social things, withdrawing yourself from people. Once you've told yourself the truth about it, then it's about telling the truth to others, which can go both ways, actually. Often it's only when one person broaches the subject, others will also say, yeah, I know, me too. I've been there, I'm there myself. And then to get support, be that psychotherapy or pharmacological treatments or rest or community, all those things can be helpful. Yeah, that's really important because I guess everyone's toolkit for supporting their brain health is going to look different. Um, what's great is that many players already have the skills required because of what we do. Where can people go to find out more information? Players approaching retirement or in retirement, it's really important to find a physiotherapist who specializes in sports and exercise medicine. They will help support you in your exercise program. It's also important to see your doctor or healthcare professional who can also support you, particularly if you have any old injuries, which many people do on, on retirement. They will help you find the right professional to help you manage these problems. More information can be found on the Brain Health Scotland uh, website where we'll be providing regular updates on new research findings, research opportunities and educational outputs like webinars. And the website is really for uh, current players as well as healthcare professionals working in the area, families, parents of kids who are playing rugby, as well as retired players themselves. Thank you so much everyone for joining. The evidence shows that you can make a number of lifestyle adjustments to support your brain health. So the time is actually right now to be informed and to take action. Looking after your brain health in the short term will better enable you to perform in the game. In the long term, it will better enable your health and well-being to thrive beyond the game. If you have any concerns about your brain health or that of someone around you, including teammates, or simply want to find out more, check out the websites mentioned. Please don't suffer in silence. Stay on top of your brain health and stay on top of your game.